Welcome back to the JB Podcast, and this is going to be part one of a two-part series of my playoff predictions, my analysis of each playoff series, um, and a little bit of the play-in, and a little bit of trade talk, surprisingly. So we got some reports recently and some interesting quotes. It's all coming up next on the JB Podcast. So the playoffs are here, and I'm really excited. Um, first of all, my team, the Brooklyn Nets, are in it, so that's always nice to see. But also, like, I can't remember the last playoffs that I really looked at and was really just confused on who to pick. There's so many questions, especially in the Western Conference. It was really hard to actually kind of talk about this, but I'm here to talk about it now. Before we get into it, I'm just going to do some quick analysis on the play-in. We're going to talk about the Eastern Conference in this episode. So, focusing on the Atlanta Hawks-Miami Heat game, let's just talk quickly about how unacceptable that effort was for the Miami Heat. They kind of made it interesting in the third quarter. But man, that was a dead game from the start. They were down 20 in the first half. And I was a little impressed from Atlanta. I picked Miami to win this game. Mainly because of I just trusted Jimmy Butler more than I trusted anybody on that Hawks team. But I guess I... And honestly, I I thought Miami was going to get swept by Boston. Maybe they would get a game. Um, So I didn't have any high hopes of Miami. This team was kind of a disappointment, you know, not kind of, definitely a disappointment. This was a terrible game. Jimmy Butler, I think we have this narrative about Jimmy that, you know, he's amazing in the playoffs and he's great in the playoffs. And yes, he's built a career on some really good playoff success, even early on in his career when he was with Chicago. Um, Kind of the, in that Brooklyn Nets series, he just was electric. He was really good and a big surprise. But you got to look at, I think the the game, the series we just always forget is that Bucks series where they got swept. It was the year after they made the finals. Like, you know, it was maxed by their great series last year, their great one run last year. But God, that was just a terrible series. And he was awful. And he talked all this stuff and he was like posting pictures on Instagram, how hard he was working and that's great and all. But He did not show up in that series at all. And I think Miami in that game was just just awful. And it's unfortunate. I think they kind of stink. But quickly to talk about Atlanta. Um, I was was really impressed by Atlanta in that game. Um, They have just this bipolar play where they just look awesome one day and they just look god-awful the next. That's not going to fly against Boston. Boston's going to take care of them. It's honestly not a great matchup, in my opinion, um, due to Trey Young being the best player on Atlanta. Speaking of Trey Young, there was some trade talk. um, And it's kind of shocking. And honestly, if I was an NBA team, I'd be really hesitant to trade for Trey Young. Now, some people could say I'm being disrespectful. Trey Young's a great player. He's a really good player. Um, He's had playoff success in the past. He did with Atlanta um, two years ago. Uh, he played excellent in a hostile environment in New York and Philly. Um, so it's a situation where you look at that and you're like, okay, you could talk yourself into it. The last two years are just very concerning for me. Last year was one thing, you know, you could look at it as a hangover. This year, I don't know what to make of it. He got he got a co-star in DeJounte Murray, if you can call him a co-star. I like DeJounte Murray. Not sure he's at that level. John Collins, Clint Capella. There's been talk about his disrespect towards coaches. He's now gone through two. Lloyd Pierce and Nate McMillan. 
He had success with Nate McMillan, and it still didn't work out. So, Quinn Snyder's there. Hasn't really made like a real impact on what they've done. It's basically the same team. I expect next year to see if he really makes a difference. But DeAndre Hunter, disappointing. But it just seems like Trey Young, and I hate to say this, but it is true, I think, when you look at the All-Star votes and had the players voted him like 13th in guards or something, it just doesn't look that fun to play with, and he doesn't defend. So I think the perfect spot for a person like Trey Young is to go to a place where there's wings and defense around him, obviously, guys who could shoot threes as well. And you can look at places like Orlando. I think Orlando is a good place for a point guard because they have Paolo Bancaro and Franz Wagner and Wendell Carter Jr. And got some good bench pieces and some young talent to trade while keeping those guys. I think that's a Trey Young team you can look at. Brooklyn is another Trey Young team you could look at. I don't think the Knicks would be interested in Trey Young because they already got Jalen Brunson. So... Not really sure. I think Knicks fans and the organization may rather have Jalen Brunson, even though he's a less talented player than Trey Young. It's just all the noise about Trey Young this early on in his career is just concerning. And honestly, I don't really know where he goes. I'm sure as the offseason goes on, we'll talk more about it. I think Brooklyn probably makes the most sense because they would have things that Atlanta could want. But they just went through like three, four years of headaches with Kyrie Irving. I'm not sure they want to do that. The other player that I'm going to talk about now, Damian Lillard, made noise when he was on Stephen A's World saying, I don't know if if, if Portland's going to keep on bringing young talent in. I'm going to want to move on, which I said this last episode. I think Dame's going to be gone this offseason unless they get lucky in the lottery, get Victor, or they trade for a massive star, which the only one I can even think of is like Bradley Beal that could like change something, but I don't even, Bradley Beal in Portland with Lillard. That's basically, you're basically getting McCollum and Lillard again. So I don't, I think it's time for him to move on. I think Portland, it's better off for Portland anyway, but I think if you're Dame, I think you're looking at Philadelphia. If Harden moves on, maybe they can make a package of Tyrese Maxey, Tobias Harris to match, to match the salaries. Maybe like one more player, maybe like a Paul Reed. I know Philly fans love Paul Reed, but if you haven't beat, I think it's fine. <laughs> and then obviously a bunch of draft picks. Now you could be like, that's too much, but I think you could look at Maxi and be like, well, it doesn't seem like Maxi's so useful here in Philly. And if it means possibly leading to Embiid requesting a trade because he's like, where's my second co star? I think you're fine with giving up Tyrese Maxi. They've been trying to get rid of Tobias Harris forever. But you would have to give up at least three first-round draft picks in that. Just because Maxi, I think, is a better player than the other team I'm going to mention, what they have to offer. The other team is Brooklyn. <laughs> I think a lot of people are going to be like, oh, he's a Nets fan. But it is true. They have a bunch of draft picks going forward. They could trade for a star. It's what I said constantly before. Like, And Dame makes a lot of sense there because you're going to a market. Um, I think whoever has to be in that trade, you're not putting bridges in that trade. Cam Johnson is a free agent. You can't put him in that trade. Um, you're also not going to trade Nick Claxton because he's your only center. So I think the trade is something you got to put Joe Harris in there because it matches the salaries. Spencer Dinwiddie would also be in that trade. And I think Cam Thomas uh, definitely has to be in that trade. And then you'd have to overhaul them with draft picks, which they can do. I don't know if I love that as a Nets fan, but if Damian Lillard came to Brooklyn and then he could possibly bring someone else and Joe Sy is willing to pay, I think it could end up working really well. But also Philly, if they lose James Harden, I think could go the desperate path and trade for Damian Lillard because that's another guy Maury was trying to get, and Maury is an excellent GM, so you can't rule that out. So that's all on the Damian Lillard trade on stuff. I just wanted to get that out of the way. Let's talk about uh, the other playing game. Bulls, Raptors, it's time for Toronto to blow it up. I think they they wanted to see how the rest of the season would go with OG and OB, Siakam. They actually played really well in the second half of the season. They got a real center in there with Yaka Pertle, uh, and Fred Van Vliet played a little bit better. 
but ultimately, I don't see Fred Van Vliet. I don't see Pascal Siakam. I don't see OG Ananobi on this team for very long. Definitely not Fred Van Vliet. Fred Van Vliet is gone this summer, I believe. Um, whether he leaves for nothing or they get a sign and trade for him, not really sure. But Siakam's going to be a free agent after next year. I actually could see Siakam staying, maybe. Um, just because... I, 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 I don't know why he would, but I feel like Masai should just trade him this offseason. But, I don't know, they seem to really like him there. And he obviously had a really good season. But he just gets in the way of Scotty Barnes' development, and I don't see it. OG Ananobi is going to be coveted by crazy amounts of Western Conference opponents. I can see Memphis being in the hunt for him, right? Because if you're going to get into a little foreshadowing, but Memphis and Phoenix could meet up in the Conference Finals, just saying. OG and Anobi could go there, all that stuff. But the Toronto Raptors, it's time to move on. Nick Nurse, there's already issues with him. And despite the success that he's had, they, it doesn't seem to matter. His voices seem to stop there. Like I said, look out for Houston, right? That's been mentioned like crazy. That's the one place that I've heard, actually. But we'll see. But Toronto's done. I was really impressed with Chicago, actually. DeMar DeRozan, obviously... His daughter screaming at every free throw Toronto took actually made an impact, which was hilarious to see. And I tweeted this mid-game. I got to learn my lesson not to tweet mid-game because I said Toronto should have came out with the win and honestly would have been a more entertaining matchup versus Milwaukee than Miami or Atlanta or Chicago, in my opinion, because I think their size and length would match up and they have experience, those guys. It just would have been a more entertaining series. But they can't score at the end of games. They just can't. There's not enough shooting out there. And Fred Van Vliet has to, like, make crucial, like, fadeaway jumpers. And his jump shot is slow. It looks weird. And it's just it, it it's just a slow shot to get off. And I don't know how he gets it off. He's, he's one of the highest shots in the league. Like, the arc on that thing is crazy. But it's time for Toronto to move on. And Chicago winning that game was a big deal for them. I was really impressed by them. Their offseason is still going to be interesting now. So as bad as the Heat looked in the last game versus the Hawks, Max Struess showed up. And Jimmy Butler also helped in ways. And they took out the Bulls. I got to say, after that loss to Atlanta, I was thinking that Chicago was going to come into Miami and just completely kill them because Miami looks like they don't even like playing together, honestly. Either way, though, I had my Miami... Either these teams were going to lose to the Bucks anyway, so there wasn't that much to see. Clearly, the Bulls missed uh, DeMar DeRozan's daughter. Um, but I was actually really impressed because Miami came out uh, hot, and it was like, all right, Miami's like going to actually try this game, it looks like. And then Chicago looks like they were going to wipe that away, right? They came back, Zach Levine with the big uh, fast break dunk, gave him the lead and all that stuff. So, like, it was a situation where it, w- it seemed like Chicago was going to take over, and in the final few minutes, the Heat just ruined all the momentum Chicago could have had. They, I believe they ended uh, on a 14-1 to run, something like that. Um, the game was a lot closer than the final score shows. But... There wasn't too men too many thoughts from this game. It was a little like I, I did pick Miami and Atlanta to come out of the play in. I picked Miami to be the seventh seed, but obviously that changed. But Miami, Milwaukee, I don't really see that as a as a threat in there. All right, time to talk about the Eastern Conference matchups. The Knicks and the Cavs. Everyone's excited about this series. I can understand why the Knicks were in on Donovan Mitchell over the summer. They didn't get him. However, it looks like there's no Julius Randle in this series. So, I think here, two things can be true at the same time. Julius Randle is not going to be in this series, which is going to hurt the Knicks. And I also believe if Julius Randle was playing, the impact wouldn't be as good as you think think and I think Knicks fans know that because Jalen Brunson recently I think scored 48 points to beat the Cavs on the road with no Julius Randle Julius Randle's game does not seem to fit well in the playoffs because he's very 
uh, ISO heavy, and I don't think he's skilled enough as other players to really play through scouting reports like that. If a whole team has a seven-game series against him and they're really planning against him, it doesn't seem to work. Now, this time they have Brunson, though. So Jalen Brunson obviously beat a Utah Jazz team that had Donovan Mitchell. But that Jazz team seemed to just kind of be toast, right? It seemed like Quinn Snyder's voice had run its course. Rudy Gobert and Mitchell, they just had problems all year. And that team didn't look like they were – they had any pride. And they lost. And Luka was injured for most of that series. But I think it said more a lot about Utah than uh, even da- Jalen Brunson's great performances. This is going to be a tough series for the Knicks, in my opinion. The Knicks have played well against the Cavs this year in the regular season. I think that's important to note. I like some of the Knicks players. I think they have a better coach. But, and and also the series could change if Randall comes back in. I'm assuming Randall's not going to play in this series. So that has something to do. If he is in this series, obviously things could change. But Cleveland has the best player who plays better in the playoffs, Donovan Mitchell. They have elite guard play in general. So the Knicks have Jalen Brunson, but the Cavs have Darius Garland. Brunson's had a better year than Garland this year. But if I'm taking players in the future, I want Darius Garland just because he's younger. But they're at the same level. They both didn't make the all-star team this year. And Cleveland has elite defense and rim protection. They have a defensive player of the year candidate in Mobley. They have a guy in Jared Allen who's no slouch as well, who's better than Mitchell Robinson. Mitchell Robinson's really good. He's not Jared Allen. And the key for the Knicks to compete in this series is going to be their consistent bench scoring, but rotations tighten in the playoffs, and which is why I don't think their bench scoring is going to make as much of an impact as people think. So, my ultimate conclusion at the end of this series is that Donovan, Donovan Mitchell is going to play great. He's going to play great in MSG. Um, that Knicks fan base is going to be insane. They're going to hate my prediction, though. I have the Knicks losing to the Cavs in five games. And I think that's going to be a bit of an eye-opener for some people listening to this. Because a lot of people see this as the series. I just don't see it because Randall's not going to be in there. And I just think Donovan Mitchell's the best player in the series. But I do think the Knicks are going to make each game competitive. And honestly, the stats for Donovan Mitchell in crunch time aren't the best. Also, the Cavs bench and their three spot is a lot to be desired. I love Karis LeVert as for what he did in Brooklyn, but he's not that guy to really help them, I think. So Cleveland's depth, and honestly their coach is also a bit of a question. I'm not the biggest fan of Bickerstaff. The Knicks definitely have a shot to make this more interesting, and if they get Randall back, it could change some things. Ultimately, I'm not the biggest believer in this Knicks squad. That's why I have them losing in five games. Coming up next, now this is going to be a series that Knicks fans are going to kill me for, but it's the truth. Net 76ers. I think a lot of people, not 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 I think, I know. I mean, if you just look at the betting odds, everybody has Philly winning this series, and I do too. I have Philadelphia winning this series, but I think a lot of people see this as a series that is not interesting, and that's where I could not disagree more. Uh, This Brooklyn Nets team traded Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving. That is why no one's taking them seriously. A lot of their games were pulled off of national television. Uh, But it's important to note, and and also, like, if you look at the record uh, post the trade deadline, I think the Nets finished 13 and 15. It's not great. Um, But if you consider that this is a brand new group, and it took them maybe some time to get acclimated. I think it's something to be praised for that they're in the playoffs. But you could argue that maybe they've gotten a little too much credit because of that. 
And it's also worth noting that this Philadelphia 76ers team has played all year. So they're going to have more chemistry and continuity than this Brooklyn Nets team. So really, this Nets team has nothing to lose. Philadelphia has everything to lose in this series because people expect them to at least make it to the second round. And I think Philly fans may have more expectations. They expect to get past the second round. But they've struggled against Boston all year, and we'll get into that later. But here's what's important to note about the Nets. First of all, you can't really take the season series too seriously because, yes, they've handled them all year, but they've been... They've had several different teams. I mean, the first game, Philly played none of their guys, and the Nets played all of their guys. And just uh, that was when the Nets were still figuring things out. And they completely shocked them. That was the Ben Simmons uh, homecoming. And Simmons actually played really well in that game. Just obviously uh, wasn't enough because Ben Simmons's game doesn't take over. The second game, no Kevin Durant. Nets fought, but uh, lost in a in a in a tight one at the end. And then the next game, the Nets played at home, um, and uh, that was the first game Mikel Bridges, Cam Johnson played, and Dorian Finney-Smith and Spencer Dinwiddie. They all played together for the first time. They played really well, and honestly, if you look look back at that game, they should have won it. Uh, couldn't score in the final four minutes of the game which is going to be something that you look at in this series. I think that's the best game to look back at. But if you saw in that game, Philly struggled with their length. And then the last game, you know, no one played. So I'm not going to take that seriously. So in this one, James Harden has an Achilles injury that he says is okay for, but didn't look that great at the end of the season. This team does not, this 76ers team does not, Defend well in transition. That is really bad, especially for an S team that runs and is going to shoot a lot of threes. This Nets team has crafty little guards that can shoot. Seth Curry, I actually think, can play in this series because of the bad defensive pack court of the Philadelphia 76ers. Spencer Dinwiddie should have a great series because he's really good at getting downhill. And uh, Philly's guard play in the back court isn't going to be able to handle it. Um, you could make the argument on the other end for James Harden, but the Nets switching defense is, it's going to be hard for Harden to turn the corner and really get downhill at all. So I expect Maxi and Harden to not be as effective as they usually would be. But obviously, Philadelphia is not favored in the series because of that. They're favored because of Joel Embiid. Philadelphia has the best player in the series. That and he's the MVP. He's going to be the MVP. So, and I can't say I've, um, I'm not scared of him <laughs> as a Nets fan. But the reality is, you're not going to be able to stop what Joel Embiid does. You're not going to be able to do it. No one's going to be able to do it. He's too big, he's too skilled, and he can shoot. So, you're not going to be able to do it. However, Nick Claxton is one of the defensive, uh, is an all defensive first team candidate and he's no slouch yeah he's skinnier than Joel Embiid but like how many big guys are match up with Joel Embiid physically like it's unrealistic the Nets are going to be scrapping they're going to be they got wings to deal with uh Tobias Harris and James Harden those guys and they're going to be able to dig down low on Joel Embiid and help Claxton at least a little bit uh, Daron Sharp is probably going to play in this series at least 8 to 10 minutes. Not really looking forward to that, although Sharp has played better as the year went along. All I'm asking for Daron Sharp is to foul Joel Embiid, make sure he does not uh, get am ones, and uh, also just do as the best he can to keep him off the glass because, oddly enough, despite Joel Embiid being there, Philadelphia is not the best rebounding team. Um, so, because of that, I have the Philadelphia 76ers being pushed to six games because although the Nets struggled to close out games, Philadelphia also has Doc Rivers, and I don't trust him to close out games either. So I think with the Nets' ability to have three-point shooters that have length, 
they have the smallest player in the starting five is Spencer Dinwiddie, who's six five, which is really it helps them a lot. And I think you're gonna expect I think you're gonna get a good series out of Spencer Dinwiddie and Mikel Bridges. Now Mikel Bridges is the key. They need Mikel Bridges to step up and PJ Tucker is gonna rough him up. Philadelphia should win this series. But since Harden doesn't look a hundred percent to me, not to mention all the playoff chokes he's had in the past. Not to mention Doc Rivers also has his issues. They were pushed to six games last season. It's a different Philly team. I get it. By a Toronto Raptors team that couldn't score, but had length. Philadelphia struggles with length usually. Now, they were up 3-0 in that series. I'm not going to look into it that much. But part of the reason why they struggled against the Boston Celtics this year is because they struggled with length. The Brooklyn Nets team has a lot of length and can shoot threes. So, expect it to be a better series than people are giving it credit for. Coming up next, Celtics-Hawks. Celtics in five. Atlanta's talented, but like I said earlier, they're a bipolar mess. Trae Young may give him a game. I'm going to respect Trae Young to that ability. He's a guy who has played well in the playoffs before. That hostile crowd in Boston, he played it against the New York Knicks. Like He's played against a hostile crowd before. Uh, Miami figured him out last year. So, you know, uh, DeJounte Murray, uh, I also think he's going to struggle. You can't shoot threes that well. Um, and when it comes to DeJounte Murray, he's a mid range guy about and Boston. I just don't think, I just think that backcourt of Trey on DeJounte Murray is smaller and they're going to struggle and Murray's defensive impact may not be felt as much as they think. Also, they're going to hunt Trey. This is a series where Trey is going to struggle in. He may get one game, like I said, but his shots hasn't been falling this year. He's going to be taking probably a lot of those, a lot of those deep ass threes. A lot of the Hawks players are going to look at him like, what are you doing? Like, there's other people on the team, I think. Uh, And Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum are the two best players in the series. Uh, Boston has looked a little shaky as of recent past, but they've cleaned it up. Jo- uh, I said that like early March, late February, around that time is when Boston looked a little weird, right? Blowing that lead to Brooklyn. That was a big, big uh, game. And then they lost to the Knicks a few days later. I expect Boston to show up and clean house as much as they can. Gentlemen sweep here. Uh, Atlanta, you just, I just don't, I just don't have any trust that they can keep up consistent play. Are they capable of making this a series? Absolutely. But I ha- I've i seen nothing this year to make me think any of that is possible, especially with all the recent rumors that Trey Young has been involved with. Like I said before, Bucks Heat, there's not much to say other than, yeah, obviously these teams have some history. Uh, they played in the bubble and Miami upset them. Uh, to me, this is more like the Miami team. They got swept. I expect Milwaukee to sweep Miami. I just do. Um I don't see Miami getting even a game in this series. You know, you could say I'm disrespecting Jimmy Butler, but I just think I just think my old Milwaukee's that good and Miami's just been a complete mess all year. Maybe Spo and Jimmy get them a game, but I just personally don't see it. Uh Bucks and four. Round two. 76ers versus Boston Celtics. This is gonna shock a lot of people. And Philly fans are not going to be happy with me. But, shoot me. I don't really care. I have the Celtics in five. And here's the reason why I have the Celtics in five. Um, Boston, to me, has Philly's number. Just seems to have it. They've had it the last few years. Um, You know, they got several bigs to throw at Joel Embiid, Al Horford, Robert Williams. Grant Williams hasn't had a good year, but he could at least muscle and you know you know muscle his way through on Joel Embiid some plays Boston has a lot of length and they're going to be digging down on Joel Embiid uh Doc Rivers playoff coaching I just don't I just don't trust it I have no reason to trust it Joel Missoula I get it rookie head coach also not really an advantage but it's not really a disadvantage either when you're going up against Doc Rivers playoff coaching um, I think what's also needs to be uh, said for Boston is both Tatum and Brown need to eat in this series in order to like Jason Tatum. I'm assuming Jason Tatum's going to show up and not crap the bed a few times. 
Um, but the length of Boston is going to just going to be a nightmare for Philly. And I don't think James Harden's going to have a good series at all in this, especially with, you know, the injury questions, you know, you're never really healthy in the second round. I just don't trust James Harden. I didn't trust him against the Miami series last year. Boston will eat him alive, I think, but we'll see. But Philly needs Embiid to have his best series, and Harden's got to give him good enough help. Tobias Harris and Tucker, were, they're also going to need to defend really well because they're going against Tatum and Jalen Brown. So, like, yeah, you're going to put Tucker on Tatum, but Jalen Brown's probably going to go off. And I don't know who's going to guard Jalen Brown. I guess it's Tobias Harris. Um, I don't know if it, you're going to put Tyrese Maxey, Shake Milton, James Harden. I don't, I don't really know about that. Uh, but Doc needs to be at his best. Maxi needs to make a real impact off the bench, which he's capable of. He's been inconsistent this year. He's shown moments where he's been awesome. He's been he's shown moments where he's been bad. So I expect Boston's length to absolutely disrupt them. And then after that point, especially because like I I just kind of hate the way Philly just will take possessions off right they got James Harden Joel Embiid very like talented duo but I'm saying mostly this about James Harden I think Joel Embiid's a great player obviously it just seems like there are times where they're not, they're not putting in all that effort and I don't think that's going to be good enough to face a loaded Boston Celtics team they're talented enough to stay in that series but I think Boston has their number Boston and five Bucks versus Cavs I have the Bucks in five I think the Cavs actually can push the six, though, but I'm going to say Bucks in five. Um, the length and rim protection uh, plus elite guard play of Cleveland could give Milwaukee some big trouble uh, because as much as Drew Holiday is a great defender, he's not going to be able to guard Garland and Mitchell. So when you look at that, yes, Brooke Lopez is in the paint. There's also that drop coverage they play. Ultimately, the Bucks have the best player in the series, arguably the best player in the NBA. He's a nightmare to deal with in the playoffs. He gets calls. He's one of the few guys in the playoffs that will consistently get calls just for barreling his way into the basket. He's just so physical. And despite Jared Allen and Evan Mobley being down there, they're probably one of the best front courts to deal with a guy like him. That's why I'm going to say Cleveland can push the six. I just don't think Cleveland's ready. I don't trust the experience of Garland and... Karis LeVert off the bench, like I said earlier, not the biggest fan. Like, not really expecting him to make too much of an impact. Isaac Okoro, they're just going to leave him open. I just don't see Cleveland uh, getting it more interesting than six. But like I said, their length, their elite guard play uh, could make Milwaukee blink a little bit. But Mobley needs to go up a level for Cleveland. Like, I think if... Cleveland's going to give any real shot at this series. Mobley has to be at another level than he is right now, which is why I'm not saying this year they're going to pull it off. Maybe next year, maybe the year after that, they can catch up with the team like Milwaukee. That leads to the Eastern Conference Finals. Now, Celtics versus Bucks. That's going to be the best series in the playoffs if we get that, in my opinion. Celtics have been dominant for a long stretch this year. Milwaukee's caught up to that dominance and actually has been even more dominant in ways. Boston just creamed Milwaukee recently. I don't know how much stock you put into that. I wouldn't say it's nothing, though. Here's the difference to me. The Bucks have the best player in the series. I think Giannis is going to want revenge after last year. I believe he believes he, was, he caught a raw deal with Chris Middleton not being out. Now listen, Chris Middleton is my biggest question here because he hasn't really shown consistency this season and he's one of their closers. He's the he's basically the closer. So Middleton being my biggest question mark could hurt the Bucks. However, this is the one series where I think Joel Mazzulla could really like suffer and he's going to his decisions are going to matter here. And I don't know if I trust that. Because despite Budenholzer's shaky pass, the dude has won a championship. So you can't take that away from him. The Bucks have an improved supporting cast over last season. And so has Boston. But Boston has a downgrade in their coaching. Also, I think Tatum isn't vastly better from last year. Maybe a little bit. I just don't see that. 
but Malcolm Brogdon could be is going to have to be what he's been this year in this series. I have no reason to think he won't be, unless obviously he gets injured. But a big difference to me here is kind of what the difference was last year was home court. Boston had home court in that game seven. Leads to Grant Williams making a ton of threes. Crowd going nuts. Building off that momentum. Milwaukee doesn't have a slouch of a home crowd at all. They will show up. And I see that as a big difference in this series. Brooke Lopez is better this year significantly. Drew Holiday, great season. So despite Middleton not being what he is usually... That, that, that to me, like Brooke Lopez being great and Drew Holiday being great matters. I also think Bobby Portis also great season this year. However, Boston needs Tatum and Smart, by the way. Marcus Smart also not the greatest year, especially with Derek White being so good this year. I just wonder why they don't play him more and maybe close out games with him. Because Marcus Smart has not been that guy this year, and they need him to be that guy. At least close to it, what he was last year. And Tatum can't have a bad game. Tatum can't be having games. Like, listen, maybe one, he can get away with one and a loss, but like consistently, if they want to really win this series, he has to be consistent. And he has to be finishing at the rim better. He's got to be smarter with his shot selection. He takes a lot of step back threes that sometimes you wonder why you're taking that. To me, Milwaukee has been consistent. Giannis is going to be there. He's going to be ready. I have the Milwaukee Bucks winning this in seven games, going to the finals. So that's the Eastern Conference predictions and episode. Uh, it has concluded now. Next episode, I'm going to talk about the Western Conference. That's a little dicier. Uh, that was was really hard to put together. So forgive me if it's different than your opinion. But that's it for the Eastern Conference episode. I'll see you guys next episode, part two for the Western Conference. <laughs>